Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa. Kanti paramanta potitikati. The gata which introduces this evening's talk was uh, a very famous one, the first stanza of the Awada Patimokha, that uh, one of the stanzas, depending on which version you use, the opening one or in the middle, it's talking about Kanti being one of the supreme of the spiritual qualities. And I wanted to talk this evening about Kanti, about patience. Uh, mostly because it's something I haven't talked about uh, very often and also it's uh, pertinent to what happens at this stage of a retreat. Uh, almost uh, three weeks have gone past, the beginning of the retreat is over and uh, some people are building momentum, some people are struggling, uh, whatever that the practice of patience, the perception of patience the uh, use of patience uh, in our lifestyle here in a monastery during retreat time is uh, most effective for clearing away many problems and difficulties and for speeding up the path to Nibbana. I was saying in the last year or so that patience is the fastest way. But it's not only the fastest way, it reveals a lot of Dhamma just in and of itself. (coughs) So often, patience goes against the stream of our defilements because all of us who are brought up in a Western culture are always uh, conditioned to seek that instant gratification. If it's not instant, at least pretty quickly. And very few people are willing to put in the sort of time required to gain things which are really useful in the world. People are always looking for shortcuts and the path of Buddhism has been littered uh, with techniques, uh, traditions, whole schools which teach that shortcut. But like many shortcuts in life, they only end up getting you even more lost than you were before. But the patience is something which goes against those tendencies in the mind, uh, conditioned from Western life. (coughs) And it's this which I wish to talk about this evening. Uh, The practice of patience starts off with just the ordinary things of our life, the difficulties which happen from time to time, whether it's physical ailments, whether it's uh, mental uh, ailments, defilements which build up Uh, emotional uh, black spots in our mind. Whatever these are, (coughs) that patience is a marvellous tool to overcome these. It's not just enduring them, but it works at a far deeper level to actually overcome them. Remember that most of the defilements are those things which are associated with craving, which makes you want to do something try and get rid of the problem or run somewhere else where that problem isn't. Its uh, defilements always make you move. They stop the stillness. They destroy the peace and create business for you. They make you move. (coughs) What patience does is to refuse to move. Is to say, I'm going to just stick uh, stick here, stand my ground, and just allow all these very strong winds of negativity, these strong winds of lust, these strong winds of desire, these strong winds of envy, whatever they are, to actually blow around me but not make me move. That takes this quality which we call patience, the ability to stand one's ground and wait for results to come. And of course, one has to wait for a long time. 
But there's something about these teachings either because one has experienced the results of these teachings before or it's just because it resonates deeply within, within you, maybe some past experiences of previous lives, that gives you faith that such a teaching of patience might be the solution to the problem. <laughs> and indeed that those monks which I have known in the past who have practiced such patience, even in the most difficult of times, who have stood their ground, have always experienced just the truth which they should have known about all along. That whatever state of mind or state of body you have to experience, it all must eventually finish and change. It's impermanence, anicca. And so armed with the faith or the knowledge that all conditions are impermanent, it makes it far easier to be patient and also patience becomes your tool to uncovering that secret or that should be pretty obvious <laughs> aspect of experience of nature which sometimes we just forget and are oblivious of. So by the practicing of the patience when times are tough, as usually say when the going gets tough, the tough gets going, but that's just in the world. In Buddhism, when the going gets tough, the tough stand still. <coughs> they just allow the storm just to, to break around them. But they are patient because they know it is going to pass. And every time you don't move, every time you practice that patience, the wisdom gets stronger, that you know these things do not belong to you because they will pass. They are just visitors coming in to stay a short while. They don't stick around all that long. By sticking around all that long, I mean they may stick around a couple of years, 30 years, they may stick around a couple of lifetimes, but that's not long in the scheme of things. Eventually they disappear. <laughs> that patience sees them through. And so that patience is something which gives you the opportunity to see such conditions rise, but also to see them pass away again, to see them fade. And that endurance gives you the knowledge that these aren't real entities which persist, which last, which are eternal, which are a problem. These states of mind which you have to endure, we're going to be there forever then that would be a problem. If you knew it's only a few days, a few hours, a few moments, then it shows you that patience can see through all of these things. And when monks are practiced like this, it's given them the understanding of impermanence and also the strength which comes from that wisdom. That wisdom gives you that strength. That's why it's one of the the Indriya is one of the balas, the Panyindriya. So by learning how to just to bear with these things, we find that all of these things, whether it's a, a, a mental uh, <coughs> problem or whether it's a physical problem, whether it's a backache or a cold or a toothache or just anger or whatever else, all these things would eventually pass away. Well, thank you. What comes to my mind now is a well-known teaching of Ajahn Chah who used to say, whenever you get angry, really angry at somebody, especially if you get angry in this monastery, then get out a clock, put it in front of you and see how long you can keep angry for. Time yourself. See if you can beat your record. What that really does, by putting a clock in front of you when you're angry, it brings to mind that this anger does not last. It's impermanent, it passes away. If it's lust, it shows that lust passes, it doesn't last very long. <coughs> if it's ill will, if it's depression, whatever, it shows it does not last. And that gives you the means by which to be patient. But also that patience gives you the means to stand still long enough to see these things when we're talking about practices of insight, of understanding, of uncovering the truth of these things, 
you can never understand these things when you're on the run, as it were, trying to escape. There comes a time in our life when we have to stand our ground and face our enemies with that patience to stand still long enough to get to know the nature of these things. It is only when we get to know the nature of our defilements, especially those coarser ones, can we have a hope to be free from them. And so patience is that which gives the time, the opportunity to be able to learn from these things. So whenever a problem comes up in our monastic life, if we apply patience to that problem, we are not just bearing with it, hoping it will go away. We're also, at that time, giving ourselves the opportunity to learn, to investigate, just by sheer patience. Because by patience we're not moving, we're not interfering. In the same way that a person performs an experiment without interfering, you know, with the sample which they're trying to you know, find out what its properties are. As I was saying, I think, last week, like a bird watcher, the only way they can look at the birds and find out their true nature is to be absolutely still so the birds don't know they're being watched. If the birds know they're being watched, they'll play up to the cameras in the same way. That patience gives you the opportunity to be still enough to be able to see the defilements at work, to see their nature and thereby sort of uncover the reasons why they arise, uncover why they keep hold of the mind, what their fuel is, and find out how it is that they can disappear and never arise again. (coughs) You're checking these things out and patience is what gives you that opportunity but also that patience because it requires that stillness, that immobility, not doing things, also lays the groundwork for samadhi to occur. Even when you're meditating, sitting on your nice cushion, when you're feeling good, still it takes a lot of patience to be able to stay with the body when it's aching, when it's itching, when it wants to cough, and not doing anything just to bear with these things, knowing that if you don't move, if you don't scratch, then that scratch will go away all by itself. (coughs) It's the experience of new meditators, that when they start scratching, moving, the body gets even more uncomfortable. Experienced meditators know every time you scratch, there'll be another scratch waiting. Another, sorry, every time you scratch, there'll be another itch waiting to be scratched next in line. And the itches never go away through scratching. In the same way that just by enduring those little feelings, they eventually disappear. You're patient enough to allow things to settle down and to disappear. You're patient enough to give the mind time to come to the breath. You're patient enough to allow the breath to settle down All of this meditation takes that degree of patience. (coughs) That degree of patience is a non-doing, a non-going, but it's enduring some things which we find are not to our satisfaction, things which don't please us. Patience is built up through being still when our tendencies want us to move wanting us to fix things up. Even in this time, the rains retreat, there are so many things to be fixed up. There's so many unfinished business, odd jobs, things to do. Even though three weeks have gone past, have you tied up all your loose ends yet? If you say yes, then I don't think you're being honest. The only way to tie up loose ends is to leave them loose. There's always more loose ends waiting to be tied up. So you just do so much and then you leave them. You have to be patient even though these things 
like screaming at you to be done. <laughs> You're patient to be able to endure, to be still, not to do, not to fix what you think could be fixed. It's the patience of non-doing, letting go, being still, disentangling yourself from the world. It is the nature of the world always to call you to action. It is the nature of the world always to want you to do something, to fix something, to build something, to improve something. It's always this time of the year when I look at the monastery. Look at all the things which have been done and all the things which need to be done. If I look at all the things which need to be done, you start to think, whenever is this monastery going to be finished? And my wisdom says, Ajahn Brahm, this monastery will never be finished, if you look at it that way. You have to be patient to see this monastery is good enough. That patience gives you the space not to have to worry about thinking what to do next in the same way that I can let go of the monastery this time of the year. I'm not thinking of all the things which need to be improved to maintained, built <coughs> or whatever. In the same way you can look at your other responsibilities and say, not now. Be patient. No need to get this letter out of the way. No need to get this other job and duty out of the way. Be patient. Leave it unfinished. And if you can do that, you'll be able to develop the patience when you're sitting in meditation of leaving all these other little jobs which can come up into your mind as thoughts and as ideas unfinished. Be patient. Be patient means you're going to just watch these thoughts, these plans, these imperfections which you see through perception come up into the mind. Be patient. Don't move with them. After a while you'll find that these are like used car salesmen. They're con artists. They say this is very important. This is essential. You have to do this. Come on, get it done. The patient can see through. Mara. Mara <coughs> is the, the con artist always deluding you into thinking this needs to be done, this needs to be fixed, this is more important than your meditation, this is more important than your uh, development of insight, this is more important than Nibbana, enlightenment. Do this first of all, you can get enlightened tomorrow. Don't get caught in that trap. Be patient. So when these things come up, you don't move. That when these things come up, that you see them without moving. And you understand what they truly are. When you understand what they truly are, they disappear. As in the suttas, it says every time that the Buddha or one of the great arahats saw Mara, all they said was, Mara, I know you. And with that saying, realizing that Mara was known, Mara would <coughs> slink away with shoulders hunched, depressed, brooding. The monk knows me, the monk knows me, and could never again delude such a monk. In the same way that all of these delusions which we have, which make us move, which stop our stillness, which stop us being still enough to really get to know things, it's just Mara agitating us again and again. So one of the great weapons to defeat Mara is this great patience. We're not going to move no matter what. In the next sutta, which I'm going to read out to the Anagarikas, the Bhayabhairava Sutta, fear and dread. This was the way the Buddha overcame such fears and dreads, by just patiently standing his ground. In that sutta, <laughs> he described how sometimes he would deliberately seek out the most frightening of places, where there's supposed to be ghosts or wild animals. And whenever there was a sound, or 
some movement which suggested that there was a, a dangerous being coming to get him. He wouldn't change his posture. If he was walking, he wouldn't go slow or go fast, he'd just carry on that same pace. If he was sitting, he wouldn't get up. If he was lying down, he wouldn't pull the covers over his head to hide. He would just stand his ground until the fear disappeared. It's called patience. And obviously the Buddha found a great truth there. The fear does disappear. Like every other phenomena, it reaches its peak and then fades and goes. Like pain, like depression, like anything else which arises. This is the nature of things. And patience sees through them and conquers them. So the practice of patience in monastic life, in worldly life, (coughs) is something which gives you power and in power over the defilements and insight into them. And it's a training which not only gets rid of the coarser aspects of our life, so it frees you. You don't have these problems anymore. These problems, they arise, but you just patiently know what they are. They don't disturb you anymore. It's, you know, it's something you know, I know that. And it just comes, it just disappears very quickly. So, Whatever problem you have in your life, whether it's nervousness, fear, (coughs) whether it's guilt, whether it's uh, depression, whether it's envy, when these things come up, the practice of patience is something which can undermine their very existence, can get to know them so that it doesn't arise again. But more fundamentally than that, it gives you a powerful tool, a powerful inclination, a theme which you, imply, which you apply at all the deeper stages of your life, especially in your meditation. That patience shows you how not to move. And so often, <coughs> the reason why people fail in their meditation to gain good states of mind is because we move, because we don't have that patience to be still and just watch without doing anything. So if the very first time you sit down, you're always uncomfortable. Every time I start my meditation, I'm never comfortable. But I just patiently, just enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. And usually those pains disappear because I'm not paying attention to them, I'm not doing anything about them, I'm not scratching or anything. After a short while they just go. It's just like patiently enduring the salesman at the door. Knock, 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 ding, ding, ding. As long as you don't answer the door or look through the curtains, then they disappear. When you start watching the breath, you're going to be very patient with this breath patiently watching until it comes to you. Don't go around looking for it. Open the mind to the breath. And of course when it usually first comes up, because most people don't know how to look at something without interfering with it, it takes a while for it to settle down. In the same way that when you first sit down the body is not all that comfortable, when you first watch the breath it's not all that comfortable. It takes a while. But after a while, if you're patient enough, and be patient means you're not doing anything, you're just watching. You're not trying to control, you're not running away, you're not trying to <coughs> subvert the meditation, you're just watching patiently. Then that thing will start to calm down by itself. That's the nature of things. And you find out that this is the way how to meditate, with enormous patience. The more patient you are, the less you expect, the more you give up control, the faster the meditation develops. That's why patience is the fastest way. If you want things to happen very quickly, I want to get to beautiful breath, I want a nimitta coming up, quick. Then that sort of impatience is called craving. 
desire grabbing onto things. You never get anywhere on that path. So through making patience important, you're developing the stillness of the mind, the letting go of the mind, the abandoning of craving in the mind. And by making that patience very strong, the meditation develops very quickly. And when a nimitta comes up, you're patient enough just to wait for the nimitta, to the right nimitta. You don't rush onto nimittas which come up which basically aren't ready yet. You develop that patience just to wait. And when a nimitta comes up and it's a beautiful one, you have that patience there to enjoy the bliss without rushing it or doing anything with it. Any fear comes up, you're just patient. Because it's <coughs> that time, that bliss or that fear makes you move. Patience stops you moving. Also, the very word patient, for those of you who have been studying the, the grammar of Pali, you know, patient means something which is passive. It receives the action rather than does the action. And that idea of being a patient, being passive, receiving all of this rather than making it happen is another aspect of patience which deserves to be focused on and recognized. In those deep stages of meditation, you are just standing your ground again, patiently, like a patient. You're not doing anything. You're just allowing all this to happen. You're letting go of the doer. The doer is the opposite of being patient. So that word patience, which we all know with its double meaning, is a great key word which you can use to develop the meditation. And when one comes out of these deep meditations, those patience gives you the opportunity just to stay with whatever it is you're investigating, long enough for it to really teach you. So often that people, when they're looking, investigating, they don't see deeply enough into it. They get the superficial details and think they know because they're impatient for enlightenment. That wanting to know now means they never stick with something long enough to really get to know it to really fully understand it. When we're talking about the wisdom, the insight which comes up, either after a deep meditation or the ordinary insights in life, it takes a long while to really know something. But the fastest way is to have that stillness, that patience, to keep something in one's mind's eye for long enough with absolute stillness, patiently, until it teaches you its secrets. And you've all heard me give that simile before of holding up something. What is this? To really develop that insight, you have to be patiently watching something. It's what I call, or not what I call, what is called samadhi, the ability to sustain attention on something sustain attention on it long enough for it to literally open out to you. That patience comes naturally after stages of samadhi. It's because you've been building it up all the way through. A person who's come out of samadhi is incredibly patient. No matter what happens, no matter what people say, no matter what feelings come up, they've become almost like immovable, like a rock. It is the uh, quality of anenja which comes up, the unshakableness which is usually mentioned after the fourth jhana. But degrees of unshakability, anenja, imperturbability come up even earlier. Remember that unshakability is very close to patience. No matter what happens, no matter what is going on, one just stands there watching without interfering. That ability just to watch without interfering, 
without doing, without reacting. It's a way to gain the insight, to stand long enough with these experiences to allow them to literally enlighten you. Only through such powerful stillness, such powerful patience, can one expect to get enlightenment experiences. What do those enlightenment experiences show you? Show you just the depth of such things as impermanence, the depth of non-self, the depth of, <coughs> of dukkha. So much so that one realised that this path of patience was not just a means to an end, but becomes an end. Now the patience, where does all impatience come from anyway? It all comes from the controller, the doer, the thinking there's someone here in charge of all this, someone who's responsible for all this. When I was saying last week, not mine, not mine, not mine, it leads to peacefulness, it leads to letting go. Why does it lead to peacefulness and letting go? Because it is Dhamma, it is truth, it's so close to what's true. It leads to peace. The Buddha said to Upali, Venerable Upali said it to Mahapajapati, he said, whatever leads <coughs> to uh, things like Nibbida, to turning away from things, from the fading away, Viraga, which leads to uh, Niroda, cessation, which leads to Upasama, to peace, which leads to um, Nibbana, which leads to Sambodhi, enlightenment, to Nibbana. But that is the Dhamma, that is the truth. That's how you recognize the teachings of the Buddha. And if you practice something like not mine, it does lead to peace. It leads to letting go. That's why it's Dhamma. If you practice patience, it's the same. It leads to things fading away. It leads to peace. It leads to cessation. Because you're not giving fuel to the defilements anymore. You're standing your ground and just watching. Watching until you understand. Watching until you see that <coughs> there is no one here anyway. So why all this controlling? Why all this making? Why all this doing? Why not be someone who does little? Someone who is a patient rather than an actor. So this way that patients now, it can be considered just a huge, powerful aspect of one's path. And I've certainly practiced it a lot in my life. Sometimes if there's a problem in one's meditation, if there's a problem in one's daily life, you just stay and don't move. Stay and don't move and wait till it disappears. And no matter how bad the problem, no matter how difficult the situation, no matter how painful it is, it always disappears. It goes. And the patience doesn't really have to last all that long. A couple of days, three or four days. How much, how quickly do our moods change? Certainly we can see them changing within a couple of weeks. So we can be patient with these things. The patience gives us strength, it teaches us, it assists our meditation because it's part of the, the, <coughs> the requisites of samadhi and it gives us the ability to gain insight. Whatever it is we're facing, that we can be patient enough to just to watch without interfering, to call the, the delusion of Mara, to see it for what it truly is and then to be free. And those who are knowledgeable about patience, those people who are experienced in patience, those people <coughs> who are, have got patience, the Arahats, the marvellous beings to see, is to see that even in great pain they despair without moving. But even when people abuse them, like I've seen Ajahn Chah being abused, and just stands there, sits there, not moving. And to see such <laughs> uh, effects of patience is just marvellous to behold. 
and this is patience without effort because it's patience which isn't like uh, just a facade which someone puts up because this is what a, a holy monk is supposed to be like it's patience which comes as a result of the realization for a person who realizes there's no one at home when there's no self there's no doing there's no person to do something there's no nothing owned whether it's the body or whether it's the mind it doesn't belong to the person so why all this controlling all this struggling all this trembling all this coming and going but patience is one of the attributes of the arahat it means that you are free from the worst aspect of suffering which makes you tremble which makes you come and go which makes you move from the innate stillness of the mind so please practice the patience <coughs> if there's a problem which comes up in the meditation use it as an antidote to restlessness and ill will and hopefully you'll find it's just one more tool in the, the armory of what you have to fight off Mara what you can use to develop deep meditation and to gain freedom and peace in your life freedom and peace is available for you it's just really whether you uh, wisely take hold of these tools and make use of them in the proper way so please remember patience and put it into practice at all levels of your daily life your meditation and your practice of insight that's this evening's talk Is there any questions on the talk? Okay. <laughs>